I've got Dr. Scott Schur. We're going to do a deep dive in the world of hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Now, this is something that is relatively new to me, but I have my own personal experience with it, uh, with my wife and myself. Mm -hmm. You're the expert, man. So what is sort of just a general overview? What is HBOT when people see it at a, uh, you know, some of these clinics, some of these things? Yeah, so I think the easiest way to, to describe it is to break it down into two topics. The first one, let's talk about the definition. The definition is increased atmospheric pressure plus increased inspired oxygen equals hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So just two things, oxygen and pressure here, okay? So oxygen, everybody knows, everybody loves, everybody cares about because we don't have oxygen. Well, you know, we don't live very long. A couple minutes maybe, if you're, uh, if you're well tolerated maybe to CO2 retention, maybe a little longer. But in general, you don't live very long without oxygen because oxygen helps us make energy. Without energy, we can't make ATP, which is our currency. So we know oxygen is really important. There's only a couple ways to get oxygen into the system. Really, only one way, which is it carries, it's carried on red blood cells. So red blood cells are the type of cell in our body that carries the oxygen from our lungs when we take a deep breath or any breath. And then it goes through the rest of our system, goes through all our perif peripheral tissues and gets to our cells. And that's where we can make energy. So that's ATP, right? As we just said. So oxygen gets taken on red blood cells and gets carried everywhere. So what we all care about is oxygen carrying capacity. If you're if you're doing anything in the world, especially endurance, but that's what people mostly think about, but even just working with your kids and lifting them up, you need to have oxygen carrying capacity so you can get oxygen to your muscles when you need it. So we're relegated to how many red blood cells are in the system and how much oxygen they can carry. So every red blood cell can carry 1 billion oxygen molecules. It's actually a huge amount, but you're relegated to the number of red blood cells that you have, unless you do a couple things. Number one, you can increase the number of red blood cells you have in circulation. Our favorite example, of course, is Lance Armstrong taking a drug called epigen, which increases red blood cell density or the number of red blood cells that you have. Another way to do it is you can give yourself a transfusion. So these racers would do the same thing. They would about three months before a race, they would take blood out of, their, out of their veins and then they would transfuse themselves right during the race because then they have more red blood cells in circulation. So then you have more oxygen carrying capacity. But there's another way to get more oxygen in circulation that's not relegated to red blood cells and that's in the plasma or the liquid of the bloodstream. The liquid of the bloodstream has m many different things in it. It's mostly like a salt solution, like a saline solution, you'd say. And there's a huge amount of oxygen you can actually derive into the plasma, but you need pressure. So that's the second part of the definition. So hyperbaric therapy, we talk about oxygen, now we're talking about pressure. So pressure is, so we simulate the pressure you would feel under a certain amount of seawater in the chamber. And that pressure, so if you can imagine, if you're 33 feet below the sea, you're looking up all, at all that water, all that water is ridiculously heavy. And it's that heaviness that we actually simulate in the hyperbaric chamber that changes our physiology using fixed physics laws. The, the main law we're talking about here is called Henry's law, if anybody cares. But Henry's law drives, well, what that allows you to do is drive more oxygen, liquid oxygen into the plasma or liquid of your bloodstream. So now, instead of just having red blood cells saturated with oxygen, you have your plasma, and that can be up to 1200% more oxygen in circulation. So what hyperbaric therapy is doing, increase oxygen, increase pressure, drive more oxygen in circulation, and then you have all this magic that happens as a result of all that oxygen getting it. I also put a link down below for 30% off Thrive Market. Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store, but if you're looking for fun, kind of healthier options, especially when it comes down to processed food, like you're saying, hey, I would rather opt for Siete chips that are using cassava instead of regular corn chips. Or, hey, I want a macaroni and cheese that doesn't have the preservatives in it. Or maybe I want to get some like dehydrated vegetable snacks. It's the place for you. And you can sort by different diet type and all this stuff. They've been a sponsor on this channel for years. So full disclaimer, yes, they're a sponsor, but you supporting them supports this channel. So again, that link is in the top line of the description for 30% off your entire grocery order plus a free gift when you use that special link down below. Dang. Okay, so let's pivot to talking about this from a, a performance aspect because you mentioned Lance Armstrong, you mentioned sure. EPO, blood doping, all of this. Sure. Um, how does this potentially apply in a performance aspect? Because you're not actually, like, you're not increasing your red blood cell count, so you're not going to necessarily increase the amount of oxygen being delivered while you're exercising, but is there a practical application for performance? Well, the first thing to say is right afterwards you are, because after you get out of a hyperbaric chamber, you have all that oxygen in circulation for about 30 minutes. It drops off pretty precipitously. So, but as you're getting out of the chamber, if you were at two atmospheres of pressure, you got 1200% more oxygen in circulation. So two atmospheres is the equivalent of 33 feet of seawater, which is a very common pressure that we use. So if you're doing that, you have 1200% more oxygen in circulation for about 30 minutes or a little bit longer. So in my athletes that I work with, 
they can do their training after they get out of the hyperbaric chamber, and they're going to have more oxygen carrying capacity. So they're going to be able to work fa faster, they're going to work harder, they're going to work longer as a result of that. So they can create more stress on the system without creating more, they, the time they get to threshold, when the time that they move over to lactic acidosis and the lack of oxygen is going to be much, much further out. So I've had people that have taken hyperbaric chambers to races, for example, and they'll have a hyperbaric chamber, get out of that chamber, and then go race. It's not easy to do, but if you have the wherewithal to do this, we have tennis players that are well known to get into hyperbaric chambers before, hyper, before their, their, their matches that are, have won many, many, many Grand Slam titles um, and things like that that actually travel with hyperbaric chambers for this reason. They also use it for recovery as well because once you've done all your work and you've exercised, what hyperbaric therapy is going to do is help you recover for that. And I think that the main way to think about hyperbaric therapy and what it does is it does about five different things, okay? The first thing it does is pretty obvious, I think as we're talking, it reverses low oxygen states. So if you've had an acute trauma, acute injury where you have less oxygen, let's call it a traumatic brain injury, let's call it a stroke, let's call it a heart attack or spinal cord injury, you name it, acute partial limb amputation, and that, that's actually something that I've seen in the hospital. Hyperbaric therapy is going to reverse that low oxygen state very, very fast. And as a result of that, you're going to save tissue. So saving brain, saving heart, saving spinal cord, this is a big deal, right? So that's the first thing that's going on in the chamber. And you're re reversing low oxygen states. Second, you're decreasing inflammation and you're decreasing swelling. So this is really important if you've had an injury and you have swelling in a particular tissue, for example, the brain again, or even a tissue like your knee or your toe, or you're going to have inflammation and swelling and that's going to make it more difficult for you to heal. Third thing hyperbaric therapy does is it improves immune system function. It starts creating an ecosystem where the types of cells that are required for you to heal start just revving up. So your neutrophils, your macrophages, and then those are types of white blood cells. And then it starts helping the whole process of healing. So you're revving up the whole healing process. So like in athletes or people that I work with that either have an injury or have surgery, we're getting them better between 30 to 70% faster as opposed to just their regular healing. So they go back to their orthopedic surgeon after an ACL tear, or they go back to their plastic surgeon because they just had raccoon eyes, and they're, and they're not there for two weeks, they're there for seven. Like, that's a big deal for people, right? Maybe not raccoon eyes as much, I mean, you know, vanity, but I mean, getting back on the <laughs> no, field. it's real. Yeah, it's real, right? So, so you have low, reverse low oxygen states, decreasing inflammation and swelling, improving immune system function. You also have stem cell release. You know, you, I'm sure you know all about stem cells. So stem cells, are these baby cells in our bodies that can go anywhere they need to go to create new tissue. So you can get new brain tissue, new heart tissue, new muscle tissue, and that all can be created as a result of going in a hyperbaric chamber. The fourth thing, or the fifth thing it does, is that it's actually acute, it helps with infection, especially infections that do not like high oxygen environments. So you can imagine, uh, if you are an athlete or a high performer, there's one of those five boxes you're going to check on a regular basis. <laughs> if not two, need. three, four, yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. So. Okay, so in that case, though, yeah. are you blunting the adaptation that mm. occurs from exercise? So if you're, Good question. if going hypoxic is something where you trigger an adaptation that's allowing you to withstand, you know, higher intensity, right? Do you blunt that? So is this something that could almost be used as an ergogenic aid, but you almost would not want to use it all the time because you would be blunting things? Or how does that work? Yeah, it's a really good question. So hyperbaric therapy is its own hormetic stress because what's happening is you're creating all this oxygen in circulation. And as a result of having all that oxygen in circulation, you're creating waste products of energy metabolism, which includes carbon dioxide, but also includes reactive oxygen species. And so one of the ways that hyperbaric therapy works over the long term is actually creating a shift in what are called your epigenetics, your expression of various genes. And that happens through oxidative stress. But you make a really good point because if you're looking to make significant gains, say it's a workout, for example, that's a really good, a good example, you wouldn't want to use hyperbaric therapy right away, most likely, because you want to create that ability for the body itself to have that hormetic stress of exercise. Because what you can do on the hyperbaric side is you can use milder pressures that have less amounts of oxidative stress to help with the healing process and recovery after exercise. But you wouldn't want to do that right away. You want to wait about three to four hours after exercise to be able to do it. So I have athletes that will use their hyperbaric chamber before they go to bed. Their recovery scores go through the roof because they've had a mild exposure somewhere between 1.3 and 1.7 atmospheres. For those listening, that's about 14 to 25 feet of seawater equivalent. And they just do that for 60 to 90 minutes and their recovery goes way up. Their deep sleep goes up, their HRV goes up because you're giving the body more of a, a stimulus to help the whole system just recalibrate itself. So one thing hyperbaric therapy does always as well that I didn't mention is it improves flow. So it improves 
you know, blood flow overall, but it also improves lymphatic flow at the same time. So you're helping with the detoxification process. So as long as you're, you're thinking about like, what are your goals for training? Then you can kind of just say, well, how am I gonna use hyperbaric therapy to help me? Is it gonna be before? I can use hyperbaric therapy before so that I can have more oxygen carrying capacity for my training after. Or you can use it where you're using it like later in the day, for example, and at that point, you're using it more from a recovery perspective. Interesting. So, because I've always wondered if from, say, a, a lactate perspective, if yeah. you're training like flirting with that lactate threshold there, mm -hmm. I had always wondered, for instance, like, okay, does beta alanine blunt that to a certain degree, right? Does it actually delay or does it still, is it just delaying the inevitable? So with something like this, if you're using it before training right. specifically, in that particular case, would that delay any kind of state there? Or is it just you're pushing it hard, so it's all relative, right? You're right. pushing it harder, so you're getting the same adaptation because it's all rating of perceived exertion at that rate. Right, so your perceived exertion is going to change because you have more oxygen circulation, right? So you're not gonna reach your threshold until later. Yeah. So the idea would be that as a result of that, you're able to do more work and get and create more change as a result of being able to do more work to get to that threshold. This is all, it, it, definitely this is not something that's been studied in major like randomized control style uh, trials. It has been like with my patients and the people that I work with, the athletes, there does seem to be significant benefits and they'll see this in, in their training. They see that they can make more gains faster. Yes, yeah, so one of the things that we've noticed in athletes and just in general is that hyperbaric therapy increases VO2 max. And VO2 max, of course, is your minute to minute ventilation, how much oxygen you can actually utilize per minute. And this is something that's a longevity marker, as you know. And so in some of my athletes, we're doing these longer term protocols where, so I talked about hyperbaric therapy does everything immediately, inflammation, stem cells, reverse oxygen, but this epigenetic shift, this is because reversing low oxygen states requires new blood vessels to form. So what hyperbaric therapy does is shift expression of genes that, is, that are responsible for increasing blood vascular growth. VEGF is a, a common one for people that they care. But angiogenesis, new blood vessels, so you're creating new blood vessels in the brain, new, new blood vessels around your heart, new blood vessels in your genital region, for example. Uh, there's a, a, when I give lectures, my favorite slide to show, I shouldn't tell this because it should be a surprise, but is a, it's, an, it's a functional MRI of a penis. <laughs> And you look at blood flow before hyperbaric therapy and blood flow after, and it's significant. But like on um, a functional MRI, just looks like a tube, like with no. the colors. So you don't know what it looks like. <laughs> but I always get a great laugh because I'm like, well, it's, this is a penis, ladies and gentlemen. This is a penis. Um, so everybody loves when you can say those kinds of words on stage, right? So, but anyway, so what hyperbaric therapy is doing, whether it's in the brain, the heart, the general region, or your big toe, it doesn't matter. It's creating new vascular beds itself so that you can have sustained tissue there over the long term. And then in the heart, it's increasing blood vascular density so you have more capacity to maintain blood flow to your heart and not go into, you know, into your threshold, into lactic acidosis, for example. Or when you start having to you know, stop doing what you're doing, you can go further as a result of having hyperbaric therapy create these new blood vessels around your heart in this case. So if we, because you mentioned longevity there, yeah. so it's a good opportunity to kind of bridge that gap between yep. sort of performance and longevity. And I have to ask one question. So when you say, uh, you know, increasing sort of the vascularization, does that include like, let's like cartilaginic tissue that where you're not getting a lot of blood flow. Like you look at some of these peptides, VPC-157 kind of doing that in areas that might not get a lot of blood flow. Yeah. Do you create potentially more blood flow to areas that don't normally get a lot of blood flow? You can, I mean, there's been some pretty good studies that looked at hyperbaric therapy and how it can increase collagen production. It, it can increase bone, uh, bone, uh, when bone is healing, it has two different types of cells. It has cells that are responsible for breaking it down and building it up. Hyperbaric therapy incre increases the cells that help break or are to build up bone as well. So <clears throat> we think that hyperbaric therapy as a result of being able to create new blood vessels does improve vascularization in some of these really tough to control, tough to reach tissues, especially cartilage. But again, it has to be done in combination. So one of the things I'm always a big proponent of, I think, as you know, Tom, is that you know, hyperbaric therapy is a fantastic tool. It can accelerate healing, it can decrease infl inflammation, everything that we've been saying. But the key, like in this kind of case with a cartilage kind of so Tom, I think you know, I'm a big guy on integrations, right? So integrations of other technologies with hyperbaric oxygen therapy and then with cartilage specifically, you don't want to just think about hyperbaric therapy on its own typically. You want to think about how you're going to integrate it with maybe other interventions that are going to help with cartilage production. So like the peptides you just mentioned, maybe PRP or stem cell uh, injections and using that with, you know, and integrating that in hyperbaric therapy because the combination can be very, very powerful. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So specifically on longevity. I mean, yeah. do you see these kinds of things with uh, 
like skin, uh, like kind of rejuvenating skin. Like as you can see, okay, there's an application for wound healing. Is there sure. an application for collagen production or anything like that? And people that are looking for that sort of appearance of you know more youthful look. Sure. Yeah, there are some studies on collagen production and hyperbaric therapy. And people who do use hyperbaric therapy often will often find that their skin and their their face will feel better. That it'll look better in the mirror. It's usually more hydrated as well. As long as you're maintaining hydration during hyperbaric therapy, that's the main thing that I always talk about with my patients and clients is that hyperbaric therapy is going to rev up the whole system of metabolism. So you have to make sure you're keeping up with your losses of the aspects of your hydration, like so your minerals, for example, when you're making energy, you're also using minerals, using vitamins and things like that. So you have to make sure you're doing that. But as long as you stay up with your hydration, I mean, the nice thing, as we always say, is like what the skin do, the skin is your window to the rest of your body, right? Because you have a lot of evidence that hyperbaric therapy has a massive amount of potential for longevity overall from a, probably from a health span perspective, as well as a lifespan perspective. So specifically with health span, I mean, if we yeah. look at, I know there's a recent paper just a few months ago that kind of essentially circled everything back. I think the paper was called all roads lead to, uh, or all aging roads lead to the mitochondria, right? Sure. And it was like throughout various ways, all of it ultimately circumnavigating, whether it comes back to damage associated molecular patterns, everything coming back, circling back to mitochondrial health. Right. And I think that's where they're potentially could be a benefit with, with hyperbaric oxygen. Maybe people don't, when they look at yeah. longevity, they think, okay, my skin, like how do my joints feel, this and that, but they're not necessarily you know, flipping inside out and thinking like what's happening from the inside out. Totally. Um, I'd, I'd imagine that's where most of the benefit comes in. Yeah, I mean, so you're completely right to say that we think a lot of aging is really related to mitochondrial stress as we get older. And as we get older, the mitochondria don't work as well, and the cells don't work as well because the mitochondria are always in, in collaboration with your DNA, with your nucleus, and they're talking back and forth. And, and if the cells are under more stress, it creates more inflammation. And if you're not making enough energy, then the system gets all mucked up in various types of ways. So what hyperbaric therapy is able to do is actually rebuild new mitochondria. And it does this in a really cool way, actually. It actually does this because when you're in a hyperbaric chamber, there are periods of time, at least when you get out of the chamber. But if you're in certain types of chambers, we use something called an air break. An air break is when you're breathing oxygen in a hyperbaric chamber. And then every 20 minutes, we have you breathe air, just compressed sea level air, which is typically 21% oxygen. If you live in Colorado like me, it's about 16% oxygen. But regardless, you're going from say around 100% oxygen, depending on the type of chamber, to 21% oxygen. And when you have that shift between around 100 to around 21%, that is simulating altitude in your body, even though you're in hyperbaric conditions, which means that your body is going to release the same types of factors that it would release if you were at altitude. And that's something called HIF-1 alpha, so hypoxic inducible factor, which many athletes will know very well. So if you're releasing HIF, what you're doing is that you're actually creating mitochondrial biogenesis, you're creating new mitochondria. You're actually creating a stem cell burst and you're actually improving blood vascularization as well. And you're decreasing inflammation. So you have this really cool way of actually creating quote unquote hypoxic stimulus inside of a hyperbaric chamber. And that's something called the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. And that's a paradox because you're under high oxygen environment because you're in a hyperbaric chamber, but you're simulating altitude because the body sees you going to altitude because the relative change of you going from a high amount of oxygen to a regular amount of oxygen. So from a mitochondrial perspective, I mean, we have a huge amount of data that hyperbaric therapy is going to decrease stress in the mitochondria, increase the number that you have, make them work better. And there's also some evidence that hyperbaric therapy decreases the population of cells called senescent cells, which are also known as zombie cells. Uh, zombie cells are these cells in our body that build up as we get older. They're associated with degeneration, cancer, associated with degenerative diseases overall, uh, just death, you know, uncool, right? So bad stuff. But hyperbaric therapy looks like it decreases the population of those cells. And I think the way this is happening is because it's actually regenerating the mitochondrial function itself. So what mitochondria are supposed to also do is sense when the cell needs to die because we, our cells need to die over time and be rebuilt and repopulated. And if the mitochondria are in kind of this like weird limbo zombie state, they may not do that. But if you're able to give the mitochondria enough of a stimulus to say, hey, regenerate yourself or hey, you're too far gone, kill yourself then that's what it should do. And I think that's what hyperbaric therapy is doing from what I can tell from the literature. So you have a decrease in that senescent cell population. So overall, what you're looking at and is a huge amount of things that are happening at the cellular level to truly rebuild your mitochondria, which is amazing. So is there, is there an actual impact on uh, mutation as well? I mean, because if you look at the you know, mitochondria, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, it's like eight to 10 times the amount of mutation that occurs at a mitochondrial level just because of the exposure to ROS, right? So, does, is there an impact there? Does it 
how does it impact anything that might ultimately, like are you exposing your mitochondria to more stress when you do these air breaks sort of things? Right. And that's kind of eliciting, like triggering apoptosis to occur like a little earlier than maybe otherwise? I mean, how does that work? Yeah, it's a good question. We don't really know, you know, what it, when, when it comes down to how hyperbaric therapy is going to work in the sense of changing genetic expression. Uh, we, in the sense, we do know that it works from an epigenetic perspective and how it works on various genes to help with growth and decreasing the possibility of apoptosis and new blood vessels and overall decreasing inflammation in the system. So we don't have a good sense of exactly how that genetic shift is happening in the mitochondria, other, to say, other than to say that we know what's happening is when you stress mitochondria to some degree, they're either going to make it or break it oftentimes. And that's, and that's why exercise is so important, right? So what are you gonna do with exercise? You're gonna either make or break new mitochondria. And if you break the ones that you have, the body, what it's going to do is it's take, it, take its genetic material and make new ones. So new ones are going to be healthier. So if you have newer mitochondria, you're gonna have healthier mitochondria. So the idea is, I think what's happening is that you're just recycling mitochondria here faster as a result of being under hyperbaric conditions. And as a result of that, you're going to have newer, healthier ones at a larger population than you would otherwise. Interesting. So there's almost two different categories of benefits. There's the benefit that happens just straight up being in the hyperbaric. And then there's, I guess for a lot of people, a cascade of benefits that occur when they get out too, right? It's right. almost, I mean, because I think some of the literature I've seen has suggested like sometimes like a, a 60 minute session multiple times per week might even be better than like a 90 minute session twice a week or something. Is that because of that contrast that you get? Well, it's because of the, the cumulative exposure of oxygen on the cells creates that epigenetic shift that we've been talking about. If you don't have, you just have a couple exposures, it's the acute issue, the acute stimulus of hyperbaric therapy still exists. The, everything we talked about, inflammation, swelling, stem cells, all that's gonna happen, but you're not gonna get the epigenetic shift. And with that epigenetic, epigenetic shift, you're gonna get new blood vessels. You're gonna get inflammatory markers that stay down, not just down for that particular day. You're gonna have stem cells that actually mature into all these tissues. You're gonna have, areas of wound healing. And we talk about longevity, what is aging, but just an accumulation of wounds over time, really, in a lot of different ways. And so what hyperbaric therapy does in longer protocols in these five days a week for periods of time, 20, 30, 40, sometimes 60 sessions, is that it can help the whole process of wound healing work better. So what you're, what you're having here is that the longevity benefits are really because, and these protocols that are, that are five days a week, and, and, and as we're discussing, especially in the beginning, are creating these shifts and then helping you sustain those shifts over the long term. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so let's make a, a little pivot that's still directed at longevity, yeah. but I want to talk sleep for a minute because you mentioned the, the lymphatic system and kind of the, the changes there potentially. Mm -hmm. What about the glymphatic system? It's something I've talked about on this channel quite a bit yeah. in terms of one of the reasons that I enjoy using a sauna at night is creating what's called that intracranial pressure and kind of helping the glymphatic system. It helps me sleep, right? Uh, seems like I get more out of sleep. Are there changes that we know of to the glymphatic system? Can it help uh, with sort of intracranial pressure? Does it help sort of the lymphatic system of the brain, so to speak? So we know that hyperbaric therapy, when it infuses oxygen in the system, does get oxygen in all fluids, including cerebral sp spinal fluid. So we know that we're hyperoxygenating the cerebral spinal fluid, and as a result of that, we're getting more oxygen to the cells in our brain. When we're making more energy in the cells in our brain, just like anywhere else, we have to have a place where all that waste can be moved. And the beautiful thing about hyperbaric therapy that everybody forgets, even people in my world, in the world of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, is that pressure is happening at all times. And so what are you doing is you're actually creating a micro massage to your pressure vessels, whether it be your blood vessels, your lymphatic vessels, including your lymphatic vessels, to help with all movement of stuff out of cells into the lymphatic system and through the detoxification pathways, including the brain. So we know this is happening and pressure is such a huge part of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. There's been a lot of arguments, especially in like the mild chamber world, but the mild units that go to 1.3 or 1.5 that you can get for your house, that they don't do anything because you can get the same amount of oxygen by breathing a face mask, partial pressure wise, doesn't matter. Uh, the, the technicalities are important, but the difference that they always forget to put in there is that pressure has a huge effect on its own without having any extra oxygen in there. And the, the, one of the biggest ones is this one here, where you're getting improved lymphatic flow. But pressure itself increases energy production in your mitochondria without there being any extra oxygen as well. So pressure is a huge deal, and it's something that's left out of the conversation oftentimes in, in the hyperbaric world. Yeah, so, so is there, uh, maybe it doesn't have a direct benefit on your actual sleep, but could it have a benefit mm. on 
let's say, the effect of sleep, right? Yeah. No, so it does. I mean, I'm, I, at least it, it hasn't been studied in this way, right? But I can say from clinical experience, as I was alluding to with the athletes before, if they get into the hyperbaric chamber a couple hours before they go to bed, their sleep scores go up, their recovery scores go up, their HRV, their deep sleep, typically. I've had a number of athletes that, you know, these people that have to sleep about eight or 10 hours a night, especially like marathon runners, endurance athletes, they need to have a huge amount of recovery, but they can get the same amount of sleep and recovery in eight hours rather than 10 hours. So it's, it's a huge deal. And how much more time you have during your day, if you have two hours extra that you can train um, or that you're more recovered the next day. So no definitive studies, no randomized control studies at all. But you know, clinically, what I see is that it's improving recovery scores. And I think it's mostly because of this lymphatic flow, this detoxification that's happening both from the brain and the rest of the body. Interesting. Does, can diet potentially influence this? And I'll talk about extreme. Like if someone is ketogenic and their respiratory quotient is different, like does, yeah. does that change anything? So we know there's a lot of different ways to kind of implement the ketogenic diet within a hyperbaric ecosystem. And I've used it many, many years. The first way I got started with was uh, with Dominic Diagostino, who I'm sure you know. He's a researcher down in Florida working with the ketogenic diet, hyperbaric oxygen therapy and cancer, but also with Naval Research, the Office of Naval Research, and looking at various aspects of implementing the ketogenic diet. And what we know as we get older is our brain's not as good at utilizing glucose to make energy, but our ability to use ketones, which are byproducts of fat, as your listeners know, to make energy stays about the same. So I've been using hyperbaric therapy in combination with people going either very low carb or keto, depending for people like with brain injury or with Alzheimer's disease or cognitive impairment, um, because you can get significant improvements in their ability to make energy and it's clean burning energy, of course, because it's on the ketogenic side as opposed to burning from glucose. Um, the other thing I think about also, also is that in people that have a lot of stress that are on, that's ongoing, ketones are protective. They protect the brain from oxidative stress. They protect the brain from too much reactive oxygen species. If you have a lot of that going on, uh, the, the biggest risk that you have in a hyperbaric chamber, it's very rare, is to have a seizure in the chamber. Seizures are because of reactive oxygen species that build up, we think. And if you have ketones on board, it could potentially prevent that kind of oxidative stress from happening and you can prevent people from having seizures. So if you've had a brain related insult, I often, I'm almost always a proponent of having them either on a ketogenic diet or a modified Atkins diet at the least, and then using exogenous ketones as well to protect the brain while you're going under hyperbaric therapy. Interesting. Yeah. So kind of making it, you know, full circle with this, like, are there any people that just regular people, maybe not necessarily taking uh, any acute injury or anything like that, that would get the most benefit from it? Are there people that would not get any benefit from it? And lastly, are there times when people should not use it, like when sure. athletes maybe like overtraining, things like right. that? Right, that's a really good question. I, I often say that it's not if hyperbaric therapy will be helpful for you, it's when. Because I think almost anybody can benefit from it. Benefit from it. It's just a matter of finding that right sweet spot. Because look, we haven't talked about, but they're expensive and they, and they require time and so you have to be thinking about when are you going to get your most bang for your buck to go into a hyperbaric chamber or to buy one, for example, when would you be a good candidate for it? So I think from a, like a longevity perspective and optimal health perspective, I think the data is just getting stronger and stronger that using hyperbaric therapy intermittently over the long term can be extremely beneficial for people that want to live longer and live healthier for all the reasons we mentioned, decreasing inflammation, stem cells, uh, new blood vessels, lymphatic flow, all those reasons. You just have to think about what's your priority at the moment. If you have something very specific that you need to do, maybe hyperbaric therapy is not right for you right now. And, and one of the main reasons that I would say is that if you're under significant amounts of stress, if you're overtraining, you can use maybe mild hyperbaric therapy, but you have to be careful there too. Because what I think about here, Tom, is that when you're making energy in the hyperbaric chamber, that requires vitamins, minerals, nutrients. It requires your ability to create energy. And it also requires your ability to detox from the energy that you make. So if your system is not set up enough to be able to make energy well, or to detox from the energy that you make, you may feel worse when you go into a hyperbaric chamber. And this happens all the time in people that overtrain and then go too deep in a hyperbaric chamber, in patients that have chronic infections, like Lyme disease, for example, or chronic autoimmunity, and they're always under significant amounts of stress. If you put them in a hyperbaric chamber, they're going to feel worse, potentially, be before uh, before, I, when I first got started in hyperbaric therapy, I didn't really realize this as much. This is about a decade ago. And like, why are these people getting worse? And I realized it's because their system can't tolerate that amount of oxygen in circulation. So I'm big on integration. And when I consult with people, which I do all over the world, on hyperbaric protocols, 80% of what I talk about has nothing to do with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It has everything to do with, do they have the foundation 
that's going to prepare them to be able to be successful in a hyperbaric chamber over the long term. Now, if it's an acute issue, you do not pass go, you go into a hyperbaric chamber, if you can, once you're safe to go in, because it's going to help you with the whole healing process. But if you have a long-term goal, then it's really important to think about how you're gonna optimize your foundation. What are the integrations that you're gonna use? How are you gonna build back your mitochondrial function enough that you can make energy, at least well enough that you're gonna be able to do that, or you have enough antioxidant capacity so that you're gonna be able to neutralize the oxidative stress that happens from being in a hyperbaric chamber. So that's kind of like the big category. When it comes to like more condition-based categories, if you're pregnant, you're not supposed to go in a hyperbaric chamber. If you have a fever, you're not supposed to go in one because it increases your risk of having a seizure in the chamber, especially deeper pressure. It's very rare, but we don't put people in. Um, if you have a history of lung disease, if, you're, uh, if you have emphysema, if you require oxygen already, you're not supposed to go in a hyperbaric chamber because your oxygen carbon dioxide balance is not as as not as easily managed when you have more oxygen in, in circulation in a hyperbaric chamber. There are more that I'm forgetting. So, but it's it basically, if it's pulmonary, cardiac, and neurological are the things that I think about. If you have any major issues in those areas, you may not want to go in a hyperbaric chamber right away. You may want to get cleared. In fact, everybody that goes into hyperbaric chamber should talk to somebody that knows what they're talking about before they go in, just to get a sense of their safety and also what kind of protocols that you'd want to do. What about sinus pressure? Yeah, so that's the last thing. So that, and the, the most common is ears. So when you're under hyperbaric pressure, you're gonna feel pressurization changes in your ears, just like if you were on a plane or a train. Of course, a plane is the opposite, right? A plane is 8,000 feet pressurized above sea level. We're putting you below, but you have the same pressurization in your ears. So the most common people issue that people have is that they'll have pressurization changes or issues with their ears with pressurization. 95% of people don't have an issue. Of the 5% that do, about 95% of those we can get through with various types of maneuvers. Everybody's heard of Valsalva before. Everybody's you know, drank water and felt their ears pop as a result of that. So there are various ways to do it. But if you have congestion, if you're congested, it's gonna make it harder to clear in the chamber. So in general, if you have like a nasal stuffiness or congestion in your inner ears, you don't wanna use hyperbaric therapy until that clears up too. Gotcha. Now, for training, if someone that is, say, going through different periodizations with deloading yeah. weeks and things like that, it sounds like it's probably better to use it for the regular person during a deloading week. Would that make sense? Like if you go through periods where you do overreach, you know, like where it's like as athletes, we do that, right? It's strategic where it's right. like, this is going to be an overreaching week. I know I'm going to be, you know, more susceptible to illness and this, but it's a, it's practical and it has to be done. Next week's a deloading week. Would you want to use it during recovery phases more so, or does it still work during like those more intense phases or and how quickly does sort of the overtraining, if you want to call it that, stack up like right. one could say i'm overtrained acutely for this week or you chronically overtrained yeah that's a really good question i think a lot of it has to do with the pressure you use in the chamber the deeper pressure is anywhere between anything deeper than 1.7 i don't use when people are an active loading because or uh, like building phase that, that you describe because that could create a lot of more oxidative stress in the system and it may just be too much if you're going really really heavy if you're using milder pressures during that time, you may be help. You may actually be able to help with recovery, though. You might actually help with the milder pressures, 1.3 atmospheres, just just a mild amount, just helping with oxygenation, with flow. That's not going to put a lot of stress on the system. You can use that on, on like on during your heavy times, when you're doing your more, uh, when you're when you're on your less heavy weeks. You're, Preloading weeks, what'd you call these? Or deloading. Deloading, sorry. Yeah. I'm not familiar with other terms. The deloading weeks, um, that's when you could potentially use deeper pressures to help with additional oxygen carrying capacity and do more work. But I would be careful when you're doing the, the bigger weeks because you may create too much stress during that time. But everybody's gonna be a little bit different. It depends on like where they are in their cycle as far as how much overtraining they're actually doing. But in general, I mean, honestly, when people are really trying to, to build, 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 I usually am very more, much more conservative with hyperbaric therapy and use it more like the 1.3 to 1.5, 1.7 maybe range for recovery only because you're putting your body under so much stress already. Do I really want you to go in a hyperbaric chamber and then go immediately do your, your huge workouts? Probably not. I probably would focus more on the recovery side because I want you to get you ready for your next day so that you're ready and recovered so you can do that additional load as you want to do it. So that's how I typically would do it. Um, the, when it comes to using hyperbaric therapy before uh, doing workouts, I often do that more as kind of one-offs for people. So it's not something if they were doing as much training as you're talking about that I would typically do. Yeah, what well, would make sense like if you say, hey, this is going to be, you know, I've got a, a 30 minute short, you know, I've got a, a 5K, right? Or yeah. something like that. And I want to, yeah. you know, going for time or like saying like, hey, like I'm going a, you know, maximal lift in this case or something like that. I'm going to have a short recovery or a Metcon. Um, so with all that, man, first yeah. of all, where can everyone find you? But sure. secondly, like where can people get their hands on like in-home units and things like that? Yeah, so, so my company is called One Base Health. 
It's the number one spelled out, O-N-E, base health. And I created this company about four years ago with a team because I really wanted to make sure that people had more of an ecosystem when they were looking at hyperbaric therapy because you can buy chambers from almost anywhere these days, as you know. But where are you getting the chamber from? Who's the team behind it? Are they creating protocols? Are they creating safety measures? And so I created a team that we create chambers now that have all those things involved in the ecosystem. We have a phone application with education. We have protocols that are built in there so you can figure out the pre, what you're gonna do before hyperbaric therapy, what are you gonna do during, what are you gonna do after? Because that's my whole framework. It's like, yes, you have this hyperbaric chamber, but what are you gonna do before, during, and after to truly leverage this technology? Because you have this amazing ability to do that and accelerate healing, but if you're, when are you gonna use your, your cold plunge? When are you gonna use your sauna? When are you gonna use your lights? When are you gonna work out? When are you gonna uh, jump off a cliff? I don't know, whatever it might be. There's always various things that you can do and I'm obviously always biased because you can use hyperbaric therapy in almost any way to help improve almost anything in this capacity when you're looking at performance, especially. So the app is there, the ecosystem is there. It's called One Base Health. Um, and I also do consults with people all over the world and, and I help with education. So I, I work with clinics that are looking at integrating hyperbaric option therapy with other modalities. It might be like a facility that has some of those things that I mentioned. It might be a professional office that's doing chiropractic care or naturopathic care or has various types of technologies. I help integrate hyperbaric therapy in that ecosystem as well. So One Base Health is the company, OneBaseHealth.com. You can find me on Instagram at Dr. Scott Scherr. My company is at One Base Health as well on Instagram. So those are the places I think mostly you can find me and get a sense of what I do. Perfect, man. Yeah. Well, as always, keep it locked in here on the channel. And Scott, thanks, my man. Thanks. See you.